Hi, I'm Dr. Gary Modicky and I'm a board certified Beverly Hills plastic surgeon. And today we're going to be going over a topic that's been in the news recently and that has to do with supermodel uh, Van Zip. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> you know I'm going to include that. It has to do with supermodel Linda Evangelista. What it has to do with is a rare, very rare complication of cool sculpting called paradoxical adipose hyperplasia. I'll try to say that 10 times fast. <laughs> what it basically means is that instead of freezing the fat and killing the fat, the fat actually grows bigger. So it's exactly the opposite of what you want from the procedure. Uh, and it is a rare complication, it is real. Although scientists and, and doctors aren't quite sure what's going on, I have some theories what could be causing it or, or why it's there, but really nobody knows exact mechanism of why this happens. Uh, she, in her case, she went and had cool sculpting um, years ago, and then she realized uh, over time that the fat was growing back. So one area that people are very suspicious of is her neck, mainly because she's hiding it a lot and there are some photos of some of her neck that looks a little bit fuller and um, aesthetically speaking not great. So there was called the Cool Sculpting Mini which went on the neck and it was for the double chin and that would be probably an awful place to get hyperplasia of the fat because obviously the double chin would grow bigger and get fuller. Now the question in, in, in her case is what can they do to fix it? You know, liposuction, different sorts of procedures, other procedures to try and melt that fat or destroy that fat. And she has said that she's done multiple procedures to do that. And that's most likely one of the things that was done to correct it. Uh, I think one of the things we should talk about in general is cool sculpting, because I think it's a very common procedure. And uh, a lot of people ask about it. Does it work? How does it work? What's the mechanism of cool sculpting? And everybody probably knows from their advertisements as freeze the fat. And that's literally what it's doing. It's freezing the fat. And basically there's a mechanism that suctions onto the body, pulls the fat up, freezes it, and once it's frozen, the fat will die and slowly go away over the next couple of months. Uh, and the reason for that is that fat cells are big and fat. <laughs> so because they're big and fat, they're very fragile and they freeze sooner than the surrounding tissues. So when they when you pull that fat into the cool sculpting device and freeze it, it won't damage the skin or the nerves because they're more resilient, but the fat itself is very fragile and it can freeze and, and then eventually die and the body will resorb that fat. In general, there's some drawbacks to that and some things that we're going to talk about, but the main drawbacks are sucking that fat up. You're not able to really smoothly put it in many different areas. You have to be careful that it doesn't get lumpy. Also, don't really want to freeze the superficial fat, only the deeper layer of the fat. And the reason is that's when you start to see lumps and bumps or things called cobblestoning or dents. So again, there's a lot of things that have to be done with the experience of the applicator, who's putting it on there, how long is it on there, where are they putting it, how much fat do you have. You have a lot of things that go into that procedure that's dependent upon the experience of the person doing it. Another very common uh, question I get about cool sculpting is what's better, cool sculpting or liposuction? The usually way that I explain it, it really depends on the volume of fat that we're talking about. You know, if somebody's coming in and needs liposuction, they're going to end up paying a lot more for cool sculpting to do multiple, multiple areas and multiple treatments rather than just maybe going and getting one liposuction procedure. So the good thing to do is probably to weigh out those things, get two different quotes, unless it's one little stub in area, a love handle or a little bit of a spare tire in the front, then, you know, those sort of things tend to do very well with that. Cool sculpting is a daytime procedure. You come in at lunchtime and do it, right? Versus liposuction is a surgical procedure, so the more planning goes into that. But when it comes down to cost versus benefit, again, if it's a larger areas, multiple areas, I think that liposuction probably would end up being more cost effective in a one-time procedure, and it's one and done. I just want to say in general that the overall satisfaction rate with cool sculpting is pretty high. Most patients are fairly happy with it. I think there are some mixed results with it, but. Just so people know, this is an exceedingly rare complication. It's something like 0.005% of cases get this sort of hyperplasia. And if we're looking at you know, the 3 million or 4 million cases that have been done of cool sculpting or more, we're talking maybe 7,000 cases. Now that sounds like a lot. In the big picture, it's not compared to the numbers, but that's quite a few patients. Uh, and that's reported cases. Uh, so maybe there's more people out there that just didn't get the result they wanted or they didn't even know they had this sort of hyperplasia going. So what is paradoxical adipose hyperplasia? <laughs> you know, the key word of the day. Basically, when that applicator is put on the fat's frozen, these patients will notice that the fat does the normal thing. It kind of goes down a little bit. And then all of a sudden, several months later, the fat starts growing back, but not only growing back, but growing back bigger. 
so that they actually get fuller, you know, wherever that applicator was put on. Personally, I think some of the things that may be going on there is anybody that uh, has knowledge of the world of fat grafting techniques or fat transplantation understands the mechanism of fat growth and the way that it heals and the way that it's transplanted and survives and that stem cells. So when you're freezing that fat, remember the fat, very fragile. Stem cells, very tiny, very resilient. So when they're freezing that fat in that area, I think there's probably an overall effect where it kills that fat, but it's leaving behind in the vascular network and in behind a lot of stem cells. And that's the perfect environment for stem cells to want to stimulate regrowth and healing. Hypoxic, damaged tissue, inflammation, a lot of stem cells, and then the damaged fat cells themselves wanting to heal, stimulating those stem cells. So to me, it seems like that may be one of the mechanisms going on in that area that we're seeing that the fat might have been killed, but a lot of the stem cells or adipose drive stem cells are still left behind and still viable. They used to think when we grafted fat, so we'd take you know, facial fat grafting, we'd take fat out and put it in the face, they thought, oh, it's just surviving, like the fat, whatever lives, lives, based on the blood supply. But the newer theories of the, how that fat grafting survives is actually that the fat's transplanted, it actually dies, but the stem cells there help regenerate that fat back. So there's many different mechanisms what's going on and we've realized that if we increase the concentration of stem cells in the facial fat grafting it actually does better more fat survives more fat is regenerated so in this area if we have damage again just like the transplanted fat to an area that has a high concentration of stem cells is it possible that these stem cells are regenerating that fat and causing the hyperplasia and i think one other thing i wanted to mention that for because another thing that i'm always getting asked about is if I do fat grafting, can I freeze my fat and store it and then re-inject it back in my face or my body later? And the answer, I'd always come back to cool sculpting and say, well, no, you're going to literally kill the fat. What you can do is freeze that fat for the stem cells because the stem cells will survive the freezing process. So again, all of these things seem to be sort of in a strange way all related, right? The mechanisms of fat graft survival, what you can freeze and then re-inject and use later and then the cool sculpting and the hyperplasia. So I think there's definitely some connections here in those worlds. And so I'm not completely surprised that something like this may happen in certain people, uh, depending again on that person, location, the amount of stem cells and what's going on, the amount of inflammation that happened afterwards. So again, a rare thing and nobody knows, I'm not saying that's the exact mechanism, but it seems to make some sort of sense. And they may discover later what the exact mechanism is, but all I wanted to really say in all of this is that it is a real complication, it is rare, and I think people should be aware that it can happen so that they can gauge the risk from it.